I'm Ezekiel Boone, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Ezekiel Boone. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I really appreciate you listening. If you go to hankgarner.com, you can go through all of the archives, more than 300 shows, author interviews with the very best people in publishing today. On the right-hand sidebar, there's places where you can subscribe uh, for just about every platform that you could possibly listen to the show on. I'd like to thank some sponsors today for their faithful support and for enabling us to bring you quality content like we do. Uh, Crystal Watanabe from Pico's House is uh, one of the best editors I've ever met and uh, whose work I really admire. She offers developmental editing, line editing, and beta reading. Uh, She's currently booking for May, so go ahead and send her uh, a message now to uh, get your project scheduled with her. She has four proofreaders on staff, so she can accommodate authors with uh, much shorter lead time than some other editors do. Uh, She's a new affiliate member of the SFWA and she comes recommended by best-selling authors such as Hugh Howey and Samuel Peralta. Uh, Most of her experience is with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle-grade fantasy, Uh, but she really enjoys editing all genres and can really make your project shine. If you will mention author stories when booking uh, your editing services, you can receive a $75 discount on manuscripts over 60,000 in length or $25 discount on short stories. Pico's House, P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E. Please tell Crystal that you heard about it on Author Stories. Also, the Debt Collector series by Chuck Buddha. Debt is a death sentence. Michael Wright lives the American dream. He works hard every day but still lives paycheck to paycheck. The bills keep piling up and now his 10-year-old daughter requires surgery to save her life. Michael is in a race against time to find money, but how far is he willing to go? Is he prepared to do whatever it takes? Can he defeat a menacing evil that stands in his way? The Debt Collector series is a gripping tale of psychological horror, raising questions about our modern lifestyles and the terrifying possibilities that hit too close to home. One reader described it as if serial killers and Wall Street made friends. Pay up and die, delinquent, bankrupt. The Debt Collector series is available in paperback and ebook formats exclusively from Amazon or free through Amazon Kindle Unlimited. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy. Willow Adair has a picture-perfect life, or so it seems. A stunning model turned wife and mother, she lives in a beautiful home with her husband and two kids in historic Bexley, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Columbus, Ohio. On the outside, she has everything. On the inside, she struggles with issues of self-worth, spurned by her neglectful husband and hated by her rebellious teen daughter. Willow never feels she is good enough. She fears everyone she loves will leave. Walk Beside Me is the story of a woman who peels away the layers to find her inner warrior, a woman who faces insurmountable odds and, thanks to her earthly angels, learns to treasure the gift of God's infinite light and love. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy Thank you to all of our sponsors for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, please go to HankGarner.com, and there's a link in the top menu bar where you can do that. At the end of the show, if you'll stick around, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to be recording with Ezekiel Boone, uh, who is the author of a a series of books, uh, the Hatching series. It begins with book one, The Hatching, and then book two, Skitter, and book three, which is uh, just about to drop, called Zero Day, and uh, I was telling uh, Zeke, as he told me to call him before we started recording, uh, that these were some of the scariest books I've read in a while, but good scary. Uh, so welcome to the show, Ezekiel. Thank you for having me. Uh, Zeke, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, boy. I, you know, 
for me, it was I was a reluctant reader growing up. Um, and when I first started to read, you know, whatever that would have been, you know, first, second grade, um, I think like a lot of people, I didn't want to read and I, I like story time. And I remember um, really clearly my mom reading me Johnny Tremaine. Have you read that book, Johnny Tremaine? I have not, I don't think. OK, so it's, it's set in the Revolutionary War and it's about um, a kid who works as a silversmith. OK, I think I'm going to get a little details wrong. And he has like a horrifying accident where he burns his hand. I think he pours like molten silver over his hand. Ouch. Um, and I, I remember nothing else about this book, but I just remember um, that moment sort of just electrifying me. Um, and I think that was sort of the first time I was really truly alive to what books could do and stories could do. Um, and I think that was probably sort of the first moment that where I became sort of alive to that idea. Um, in terms of being an actual writer, it, it took a really long time an embarrassing long time because I always loved reading and I always loved writing, but I, I like, it just didn't occur to me that being a writer was a thing you could do. Yeah. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like I didn't. Oh no, exactly was, what you mean. Yeah, yeah. It was just one of those weird things where I, I remember one day being like, Oh wait, you can do this. Like that's a thing. Yeah. Um, and maybe it was, you know, growing up, I didn't, I didn't know anybody who was a writer. I didn't know anybody who was an artist of any kind. Um, like it didn't occur to me that was a real thing. And so, um, I didn't really start writing seriously until I was in my thirties. Well, that, that's a, uh, it seems like an odd thing, but that's a, that's a very common thread that, uh, I've heard, uh, you know, doing 300 uh, of these interviews, the, the, the rare exception, the very rare exception is the person that says when they're a little kid, I want to be a writer. And then their whole focus, their entire life is going toward being a published author. Um, yeah, very rare. Most people go and pursue other things. And then it's like books are these things that sit on the shelf and we don't really know where they come from. They're just they're kind <laughs> of magic. They just show up and we don't realize that there are real people behind those and that and that those real people are, are real people like us. And, uh, and and when that when that switch goes off, it's like, oh, my God, I could do this because I've, I've always told stories in my head or, you know, I've always you know played make believe. And and then I think that's when that. The, the gene of the storyteller turns into the craftsman of the writer. Yeah. And you know what I think a lot of it is, too, is that all we ever see is the finished product. Exactly. We don't see any of the work that goes into it. Um, uh, like maybe 10 years ago, I actually got a chance to see E.B. White's uh, an early manuscript for Charlotte's Web um, that he'd marked up by hand. And that was like this really amazing thing to be like, oh, he didn't just write it like he rewrote it and he worked on it and he fixed things up um and i think that was that was another one of those moments where i was like oh people revise stuff that's a great idea <laughs> yeah yeah um i i actually read an article uh, maybe it was a year or so ago and i don't remember where i'll have to try to dig it up um but it was lamenting um the fact that writing in the digital age all of those uh those great revisions and and, and rewrites are, are being lost uh because we just overwrite it and the the thing we don't keep we delete all of that whereas uh you know we, we don't get to see the eb white that has you know sweated over the prose and you know does this plot hook work and 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 we get to see that it's actual it's an actual craft where someone has to work on it yeah yeah uh, you said that you were a reluctant reader. Um, was there any particular reason that you were a reluctant reader? I, I know I was early. Um, I struggled with dyslexia. Uh, it was anything like that or, or just just wasn't your thing? Um, I really struggled with spelling. I mean, I was diagnosed with a learning disability. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of it was I think one of the things that happens to kids is we uh, given the books that we're supposed to read as opposed to the books that we want to read. Uh, and I think one of the things you can do if you have kids is to basically buy them or get them whatever it is they want to read um, and encourage them that, you know, my oldest daughter is a really, you know, really enjoys reading. And part of it is that, you know, my, you know, whatever she wants, I say, yes, whether it's a graphic novel, whether it's, you know, a novel or a series, um, and for me, you know, I think one of the smart things that my parents did is they read aloud to me. Um, but when I started reading, you know, if I wanted comic books, they'd buy me comic books. Um, and they also they were really big readers. And so that was modeled for me. But, yeah, I think the big thing for me was I just I struggled so much with spelling early on um, that I think I probably just took me a little while longer to get into it. 
uh, I, I had parents like that too, that would, uh, uh, would get us whatever we wanted. And, and I, I remember that the thing that actually opened the door for me, you know, in my mind to reading was comic books. And it was, a it was a justice league comic book. And, and <laughs> when, I, when I realized that I could understand the story through the pictures and then figure out, uh, what was supposed to be going on in the dialogue bubbles that the, the, um, the, the dyslexia started kind of working its way out. And it was, it was kind of magic for me. So I, I definitely, uh, concur there. Get, get kids yeah. whatever they want to read, whatever gets them interested, do it. Well, sure. we, we, we focus so much on like reading is good for you, but it's also supposed to be fun. You know, like, I mean, you know, when I work with writers, when I'm teaching writers, I always say to them, if, if, if I don't want to turn the page, Nothing else matters. And if you can't remember that, like if you can't remember that reading is supposed to at least some of the times be fun, right. then what are, you, what are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so as a kid, what things captured your imagination besides the, the little boy maimed uh, <laughs> <the> silversmith? <laughs> I, I read everything. And I, I, and I mean that. Like I read, um, you know, I think like a lot of, a lot of kids who grew up with readers, you know, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy um, but I also read um, crime stuff and thrillers. I read all my parents' books. Uh, you know, my dad would read like Tom Clancy and Robert Ludlum, um, Clive Cussler, and I'd read all those. And then my mom would read um, mysteries and Agatha Christie's and um, even some of the the sort of um, you know a little more titillating books. Um, oh, I can't remember the names like Suzanne Collins and stuff. And I'd read all those. I, I mean, I read everything. I was a really fast reader. I'd read two books a day when I was you know, a kid and a teenager back when I had free time. Uh, um, so like if you put it in front of me, I'd read it. And it actually used to drive my brother crazy because even though he's he's a reader, too, and he loves to read, you know, he'd be waiting for me to do something like we'd be getting ready to go play hockey and I'd be sitting there eating a snack and reading. And of course, it would take me 10 times longer to get ready than it would take him because I would be reading a book while I'd be putting on my skates. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um so you you said that you didn't decide to become a, a, a quote writer until you were in your thirties. So uh, what kind of career path did you pursue? Uh, you know, getting out of school, <laughs> going to college. What, what did you think you wanted to to do and be? Yeah, the, I I don't know. Uh, that's a great <laughs> question. I uh, right out of school, I got a job right away as a human resource consultant, like and I was four months, um, and it was it was terrible. I mean, I remember. I quit that job because I was driving to work one day and I remember thinking, man, I hope I get into a car accident so I don't have to go to work. <laughs> um, and I thought that was like a sign that maybe I should quit the job. Um, so I quit the job. I got a job as a, a journalist for a little while. I'm at a, like, a community newspaper. And um, I, I was good at the writing part. I was not good at the reporting part. I didn't like asking. Like, I, I just didn't like asking the difficult questions. Um, and uh, I remember for a while there was I was working out in Colorado and I had to Every single week, I had to call the same CEO of a ski company because there was a new rumor that he was getting fired. Um, and that was, you know, that was like and every single week he would be angry at me. And so um, I quit that. And then I actually I taught rock climbing for a while. And then I was a stay at home dad for a while. Um, and that was that sort of got me up into my early 30s. And then one day it was like I was not married. I was, uh, my until I was about 30. And then I had my first kid. And, um, that's where it kept me busy for a couple of years. Um, you, before we started recording, you and I bo both said that, uh, uh, that we were kind of scared kids and, uh, you know, that uh, talking about how your books were scary good. Um, did you read any, uh, you know, scary stuff, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, any of that sort of stuff? Dean Koontz more than Stephen King. Yeah. I think, cause that's what my parents had. Gotcha. I read some Stephen King. Um, I, Definitely Michael Crichton, who wasn't really scary necessarily. Right. Um, but but he did but, have some disturbing stuff. Yes. And the disturbing doesn't bother me. I think it's yeah. more just that um, I don't like the jump scares. Right. The being startled. And so um, – and as a kid, uh, yeah, I was, I, was, I was a panicky little kid. Um, and even as an adult, like when I go to the movies now and, and a trailer comes on for something scary, you know, my friends make fun of me because I'll sit there and I'll watch it you know, with my fingers over my eyes. Um, and it's I don't the, the the crazy thing is like I don't get scared by creepy I just don't like the startle. Um, that's and, exactly and, me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's funny because it's it's there are parts in the spider books that other people have said are really really scary to them, and that have come as a surprise to me because I guess they're intense, 
Um, but to me, they they don't they don't seem as scary to me as they seem to to other people. Um, so, yeah, I uh, no, as a kid though, I remember actually this is that's totally embarrassing story. I was like maybe ten or eleven, and I had to leave Ghostbusters because <laughs> I was scared of that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, we are kindred spirits, Ezekiel. <laughs> Um, so you you had this um, um, you're the journalist for a while and rock climber and and then stay at home dad. W- what was the the kind of instigating factor that uh, that made you want to pick up the pen? You know, I think it was just one of those things that had been had been burning at me for a while, and I'd kind of sort of always I'd always kind of written, but I'd never worked at it. Um, and I, I I love my kids, and I liked being a stay at home dad. But after about four years of it, I was like, I need to do something else, and I want to try writing. And what happened is we decided that we would hire a babysitter to come in twice a week for two hours a week so I could try and write. And um, we did that, and um, it was a big deal because my, my wife basically makes a teacher's salary. So um, you know that, that $25 twice a week was a lot of money for us. And the first day that we did that, I went out into the coffee shop and I spent, you know, two hours on the internet not writing. And I came home and realized that it didn't matter that I hadn't written, that the babysitter still wanted to get paid. And so um, I started then working at it. And it took me like about a month to realize that actually working at writing was different than trying to sort of write. Um, and it was just sort of like something clicked in me. And I don't know if it was sort of all the years of reading or that I'd finally kind of reached the age where I could take it seriously. Um, but I think one of the biggest things for me was just reaching a point where I could say to myself, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give it everything. I'm going to really, 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 truly try. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. It means, you know, I, I couldn't make it, but I'm not going to give myself any excuses. Um, so I'm going to actually work at it as opposed to sort of work at it. Um, that, that's a really um, uh, interesting uh, point to, to make because uh, I think a lot of people, when, when they realize they're, they're born storytellers, they, uh, it, it's kind of like the, um, the, the really great high school athlete um, who just is so much better than everyone else uh, in, in the high school circuit. And then they, they get drafted to college. And, and then they, they realize that, oh, this is going to be a lot of work to be as good as, as I think I am. And I, I think a lot of writers go through that, that, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm always telling stories in my head. I can just sit down and do this until you sit down and actually do it. And then, oh, okay, this is actually a craft I'm going to have to work at. Um, and yeah, I think that's a, an eye opening experience for a lot of people. Yeah. I, I, and that analogy sort of, of, of the, of the athlete is a really good one because, you know, it's the sort of thing where, um, you know, if you're if you're a really good athlete in high school, like go ahead, go try, go go meet a professional athlete, right. and they'll smoke you. Yeah. Um, and some of it is just that like it's talent, but it's it's a lot of work. Like talent is probably the most fundamentally overrated thing. Yeah. Um, I think because I think a lot of people are talented, but I think the willingness to work hard and be talented, and the humility to be able to say what makes the story better, which is different than what do I like? What makes me feel better about myself? Um, you know, can you say to yourself, this makes the story better. I don't care how it makes me feel about myself. Um, and that's pretty tough, but I don't know. I think it's like, I think we, I think because we spend our entire lives writing, you learn how to write in kindergarten. Um, you think it's just one of these things you can do. Um, and so people don't feel like they should have to work at it. But if you told me that you're going to be a professional musician and I would say, well, you know, how many hours a day do you practice? And you said, I don't practice then my response would be, you're not going to be a professional musician. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know why people think they don't have to work at writing. Yeah, you're just going to be the guy noodling over in the corner of the club, and you know that, that's yeah. not, not going to get you anywhere. Um, so w- when you hired the babysitter, did, did you have an idea that you were going to work on, or was this just, I need to get out and, and just see what comes? No, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, what, I did, what I did very deliberately is I started writing short stories because I thought, they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I can do them quickly, and I can get better more quickly than that versus if I just dove, dove right into a novel. And I don't know that, if that's right or wrong. Um, it's true I took for kind some of a, people. Yeah. It's true for some people, but but it's not a not a hard and fast rule for sure. 
No, no, it's not. And, you know, the funny thing is I – um, so I, I, Ezekiel Boone is a pseudonym, and I've written literary novels under my real name. Um, and so I started out doing literary novels, even though my first love as a reader was always, um, you know, was always thrillers and, you know, um, sort of more fun books. Um, and I started out that way. Um, so the short stories are probably a good fit for that. Um, but no, I had, I had no idea what I was doing. I just kind of wanted to write. And I think in some ways still as, as a writer, all I kind of want to do is just write the thing I want to write, which I know it sounds like this sort of vague thing, but, um, but I think that like what's most fun is sort of saying, okay, what's the idea that I'm most entranced with right now? What's the thing I want to write? And then doing that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you write, um, uh, literary fiction as well as, you know, genre fiction. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think that it's so much of a divide now, uh, as it has been in the past, but you know, that there used to be, um, a, a, a serious divide between, you know, literary writers and you know, serious writers and, you know, genre and, and genre just immediately meant pulp, you know, and, and, and looked down upon. Um, as someone who does both, uh, you know, do you feel like there's any difference in writing literary and genre or is it just that does it, is it just based on the idea that, that comes to you at the time? Um, I mean, there's a difference in the focus in terms of what you're doing. Um, but, you know, like the I think some of that um, the tension that used to come from that was this idea that, like, you know, all genre fiction was bad and all literary fiction was good. And you know what? The best genre fiction is, is as good as the best literary fiction. And the worst literary fiction is as bad as the, be the worst genre fiction. Like I've read some really bad literary novels and I've read some really bad genre novels. Um, but when you do it at sort of the highest level of either, they're both pretty extraordinary. Um, I think that, you know, for me sort of when I say which is which, um, some of it is the idea or the story itself. Um, and I'm not, entirely sure, I'm not entirely sure I can explain coherently why, you know, why this is going to be a literary novel and this is going to be a thriller. Um, but I think fundamentally, it's important to remember that literary, when you say literary fiction, that's a genre. And it's, you know, it's also a genre. Um, it's just one that, that we have decided is the more, quote, important genre. Um, and I think I think what that comes from is the idea that like in genre fiction, generally the plot is given a little more importance. Um, and so I think mediocre genre can probably be more fun than mediocre literary. <laughs> well, you, mediocre literary is just a lot of navel gazing a lot of times. Um, yeah, you know, and and not that that's a bad thing. It's just you know, it's you know, when not done properly. Uh, uh, well, literary fiction has its own tropes too, and you know, uh, of I course, think, you know, I think people, um, you know, tend to overlook that. But there, there's a, a there's a formula and, and certain tropes that go into a lot of it. Uh, but when done well, people talk about those books for ages. You know, it, just like uh, you know, typical genre fiction. You know, so yeah, yeah. And those lines have really blurred. I mean, you know, Margaret Atwood for the last, you know, forever has been writing science fiction, and she won't call it science fiction, but that's that's what she writes. I mean. Um, you know, Kazuo Ishiguro, who just won the Nobel Prize, you know, Never Let Me Go, was 100% science fiction. And Sleeping, or whatever his most recent book was, it called Something with Giants, was also, like, it was fantasy. Um, so I think those lines have blurred a lot. Um, and in some ways, you know, I think the use of the, the pseudonym is mostly just about saying to my readers, hey, this is a different kind of book. Just a heads up. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so, so what was the first book that you... Uh that you got into and, and finished? Um, was it one of the, the literary or was it a, a thriller? It, it was, it was a literary novel called touch. Um, and you know, it's a relatively quiet book. Um, but I wrote, you know, it's, I, I learned how to write by learning how to write literary fiction. Um, and that was good for me because there wasn't really anywhere to hide. Um, you know, literary fiction is so much more focused on character and interaction than it is plot. And, and these are vast generalizations. Um, and what that meant is I learned how to write the stuff that I didn't know how to do. I'd grown up, I mean, I'd grown up reading primarily, you know, genre fiction. And so that's what I was born and bred with. And so I learned how to do the stuff that I didn't know how to do through literary fiction. And so when I came back, you know, when I finally did start writing genre fiction, it felt sort of like coming home. I love that. I love that. Um, so, uh, you know, did you, uh, 
how, how many days in the coffee shop did you spend writing that book? Oh God. Um, <laughs> You know, or, or, I, I guess what, what I'm asking did did you did you keep using the babysitter and getting out of the house and, and like no when you I ended you up I, I ended up serious. going to an MFA program which okay you know there there are good things and bad things about them sure um, it was good for me uh, it meant I was able to kind of write full time for a while um, but I was able to um, I was able to sell my first novel ooh, I don't know maybe five four or five years after I started writing seriously um, and then that made was able to put me in a place where I could write full time. Um, but you know, the, the short answer to how long did I spend working on the novels kind of my entire life, because at least for me, and I think this is, well, look, I think this is true of all, all writers that if, if a writer tells you they don't read, they're either a liar or they're a bad writer. Um, and so for me, I would say in some ways I was working on it my entire life just by reading that that's, that was sort of the best tool of learning how to be a writer I could think of. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, the, the MFA, you, you, mm-hmm. you sounded like you, um, uh, almost, uh, you know, shy about mentioning it. Um, I, I think, uh, some people, you know, uh, are like, oh, he, he got an MFA. Okay. He's a, you know, whatever. Um, but you know, that whatever the, the path is that, that works, you know, that those, every tool in the toolbox is, uh, you know, will get called upon it at some time. Did, did, were there things that, that you learned, uh, specifically in the MFA, that you think benefited you or was it more about the time and the, um, the focus and, uh, you know, being able to, uh, to really work on, on the craft by kind of separating yourself in, in you know, in that mindset. Yeah. I think for me that the two biggest things were, were it was this time where for a period of two or three years, sort of all I thought about and all I talked about was being a writer. I and mean, that was my job. And so I talked about it all the time, you know, in workshop, you have to talk about what's working, what's not working. It forces you to sort of say out loud and think about what do I believe in as art? Like, what do I think works? Um, and it forces you to sort of stake out positions and, and say, I like this, I don't like this, and, and to think about your own work. And so in a lot of ways, it's like practicing. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, spending, if you spend two or three years working out with a personal trainer, you know, all day, every day, you get in good shape. Um, but the other thing that was really good for me is there was there were some students in the program who were really, really good writers, and it made me push harder. Um, it made me recognize that I needed to, to work harder and push harder and aim higher. Um, that it wasn't, you know, again, it's sort of like that high school athlete analogy. If you're sort of the, if you're the star, you know, basketball player on your high school team, and you never see another basketball team, you think you're the best player in the world. Um, and so it's really good sometimes to come across other players and recognize that, nope, I need to practice a little harder. Yeah. And, and then, um, what I've noticed is I've, I've met some really great writers that I've, I've learned from and, and bounced ideas off of and been humbled by, um, is that after having some of those experiences, you go back and read some of the books that, that you've enjoyed and you start to realize that there was a lot more work that went into this than you gave, you know, books that you appreciated credit for. Oh yeah, it's it's like it's, you know my I, most of my friends uh, most of my friends at home are not writers, and you know I always when they complain about a book or a movie or more often when I'm complaining about a book or movie I always stop and say you have to remember like, it's really really hard it's hard to write a good book um, if it was easy more people would write good books um, yeah it's uh, sort of I think what happens is the the more you write and the more you think about writing and the more you talk about it. The more you're able to, when you read a book, sort of see the scaffolding that holds everything up um, and to recognize how much of that matters. Um, although I will say it drives my wife crazy because anytime we watch like a TV show or a movie, like a third of the way through, I'll be like, oh, yeah. And I'll say something and I'll basically ruin it for her because I'll point out something <laughs> she hadn't noticed. So I'm trying to stop doing that because she gets angry. Yeah, my uh, uh, I have a 22 year old son who he's in his senior year uh, as an English major and we'll be watching movies together with the rest of the family. And one of us will yell, well, here comes the third act. And there was the inciting <laughs> incident there. And I was like, would you shut up? <laughs> it's great. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so tell me about the hatching. Um, so you've, you've established yourself as a writer. You've, you've, uh, you've written, completed, you've published, you have found some success. Um, where did this weird story come from? I came from a bad dream. I just had this image of sort of a spider kind of like hatching out of the body. And um, 
I just couldn't shake that image out of my head. Um, and it just kept coming back to me. Like, I wake up with nightmares, you know, swatting at myself. And finally, I thought, you know what? Maybe I should just write the sucker and get it out and see if I can sort of get it out of my system. Um, and I just thought it would be fun. I just wanted to write something that was really, really fun. Um, you know, just a complete page turner, sort of a globe hopping kind of book. Uh, and it was also kind of scary. And I guess I realized, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I ne it never occurred to me that I was writing a horror novel. Um, I'm, you know, the book is sort of, the, 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 the three books are sort of, sometimes people call them thrillers, sometimes people call them horror novels. And I always thought of them as thrillers. And the first time somebody, you know, um, I, I, in fact, I remember when I was selling it, I was talking to some different editors. And the first editor I talked to compared it to Stephen King and said horror. And I remember thinking, what? You know, I just remember being, I just remember being completely shocked by that idea. Like it had not occurred to me that spiders who eat people might somehow be a horror novel. Um, so that tells you something about my intelligence, I guess. Well, you know, d depending on your perspective, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, well, depending <laughs> on your perspective, you know, Jurassic Park could be a horror novel. Um, it, you know, most people would think that's a stretch, but, uh, you know, I mean, you know, dino a, 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 an idyllic dinosaur island that, that goes south, uh, that's a pretty horrific, uh, you know, thing when you start thinking yeah. about it. So. Well, it's funny because the, the most common comparison I've gotten is some version of, um, you know, that the books are sort of like Jurassic Park meets The Walking Dead. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great comparison. Um, so uh, are, are you personally freaked out by spiders? Oh God, yeah. yeah, they're terrifying. They're 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 like there's a reason we're afraid of spiders. They're terrifying. <laughs> they skitter and scuttle, and they they move weird, and they're just yeah. It, it's um they are scary as heck. And um the 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 best part is you know we now of course see spiders all the time where maybe we wouldn't have noticed quite as many. And every once in a while there'll be like a really big spider. And my wife will like call me to get it. I'm like, no, nah, call call my my youngest daughter who is not afraid of spiders. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not getting that. Um, <laughs> and she uses a copy of the hatching to squish it. You know? Yeah. No, I, you know, it's funny with spiders. I'm not scared of them if I know they're there. It's when you sort of come across one. I think there's something about the way they move. Um, <laughs> yes. But there, there is something weirdly hardwired into us to be afraid of spiders because, like, the honest truth is that, you know, particularly in North America. People don't die from spiders. In, in Australia, I think it was last year, they had the first person die from a spider bite in Australia last year in like 35 years. Um, yeah, I mean, the chances of dying, the chances of being killed by a spider in the U.S. are zero, whereas something like 20 people a year die by cow in the U.S. <laughs> and nobody's writing those books, are they? Right. And nobody's <laughs> going to write about, you know, the cow evasion. <laughs> right. Oh man. So, so the nightmares keep coming back. Um, when did you realize that, that this, you know, had a plot and, and when did, when did characters come into it? Uh, almost immediately for me. I mean, I think that, I think that if you don't care about the people in the book, like if you don't care who it's happening to, you don't really care what's happening. Um, because I think well, most books down just a one sentence summary, there's a lot of space for one book and other. And so, you know, what, you know, you look at Stephen King and sort of what's the difference between, you know, The Stand and any other one of the zillions of books about a flu pandemic. Um, and it's the people. Um, and I think that's always the case. And so very early on, for me, at least, it was about about the people. Um, and, uh, you know, as soon as I started, I think one of the things that happens for me, at least, is I spend a lot of time not writing so that when I do write, I'm ready to go. Um, yeah. So I spend a lot of time thinking about the book, getting ready for the book, so that when I start, usually once I start, I kind of gallop through it. Yeah, that's a that's a really great point. Um, because it, you know, a lot of writers uh, are like, you know, I have a a daily writing habit. I, I sit down at the keyboard and I write every single day on the the work in progress. But what you, you don't hear writers talk about so much is the the time that they spend just kind of ruminating on the story, letting it. Uh, grow in their head and, um, uh, you know, kind of thinking out possibilities and, and, and uh, you know, maybe some of that internet time is actually fruitful um, <laughs> when, when we're reading about stuff, but, but how, like, what is your, um, what is your process for uh, w when you start thinking about a story for, for letting it grow before you actually sit down with paper? 
Yeah, I let it percolate for a while. And usually yeah. what happens is I have I have a list on a whiteboard in my office of I think about twelve different novel projects. And they're all things that I've sort of been percolating on, thinking about and started thinking about structure, thinking about characters, thinking about voice. Um, and I do a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of what happens is while I'm working on, you know, the, the project, whatever the current project is on, I'm thinking about these other things in the background. And usually what happens is that little queue of novels, you know, one of the novels starts to sort of work its way up. Oops, sorry if I cut out there. Um, one of the novels starts working its way up the queue a little bit so that by the time I'm done, whatever my current project is, there's another thing that's usually burning and waiting to go. Um, and it's kind of funny because what will happen is I'll be finishing a novel and I'll be saying to my wife, oh, I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to write for a month. I'm going to blah, 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 blah. You know, and, you know, she'll come down some morning. And I'll be like, you know, she's like, and she'll be like, you were up really late last night. I'm like, I finished. I finished the book. You know, I printed it out. Here it is. And she's like, what are you going to do today? And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to write for a month. And she'll come back from work and she'll be like, what did you do all today? And I'm like, oh, I started a new novel. Because <laughs> uh, it's, it's that pressure, that buildup of, of the next thing. Um, you know, and so I keep notes. I have file folders. I mean, they're when I <laughs> that makes it sound like I'm really organized. I'm not organized, but I keep notes and files. And um, you know, usually what happens is by the time I'm finished or finishing a book, I'm so ready to start the next thing because it's it's like a you know the steam is building and building and building, and it's like I, I need to sort of release that valve. So um, I spend a lot of time you know queuing these things up. And at this point, you know, I I don't have to have another idea, and I'm good for another probably good for another 10 years without coming up with any new ideas. Yeah. Un until that new one starts rattling around in your head and, and has to be written on the whiteboard. Yeah. 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 Um, are you a, are you a plotter or a, a pantser or something in the middle? In the middle. Um, I always, I usually have a really, I, I know where I'm starting. I almost always know the ending. I have a really good sense of two or three things in the middle. Um, but how I get through that often changes. Um, I think I found, you know, it's a little bit like driving where you have the route you think you're going to take and then traffic pops up. So you maybe you go off route a little bit and then all of a sudden you realize that oh, I, I could use a coffee. I'm going to pull over here. Um, and the kids really want lunch. Um, so I do both. I think that um, because I, I really value characters and what characters do, sometimes who the characters are changes the plot because you have a character who wouldn't do that thing that you need them to do. You know, you really need your character to go down to the basement. That's where the monster is. Except that you created a character who's like, I'm not going in that basement. That's dumb. Uh, so you need, to, so you either at that point either need to change the character or you need to get the monster out of the basement. Right. That's a really great point um, because you know there's a certain amount of plotting that needs to happen uh, if you're ever going to finish anything. Uh, or for for a lot of writers, some people can just completely spitball every day. And they can, you know, burn through a hundred thousand words, you know, in, in record time. Uh, I think for a lot of people, they, they get kind of off, you know, off track and, and having some, uh, some map points set out, just, you know, help to keep the thing moving and, and keep you on track. Um, but you, if you, if you set a character in the beginning and then you make them do something that is outside their nature, um, no one's going to finish that book because you have broken the trust of the reader. Yeah, I agree. And so you either at that point, you either need to change their actions or you need to change the character. Um, it's just it's it's that simple. Um, you know, characters can do things that surprise you at the time, but not in retrospect. Um, you want I, I, the ideal thing is you want your characters to do something that surprises you, but that completely makes sense at the same time. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's I, I don't know. I, I, I for several friends who've been trying to write or writing novels. I've actually suggested they try and do outlines partially because it does help to know where you're going. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hop in your car and drive across the country without a map. Right. Exactly. Um, so the, the new book, uh, the, the third book in the trilogy zero day, uh, mm -hmm. is about to come out and, and I don't want to give too much away because we're going to give away too much in the, in the, the early books. Um, but just to say, um, that the trilogy is absolutely amazing. Um, how did you come up with this um, kind of globe hopping um, scenario? Uh, you know, when when the book opens up, there's this thing that happens in the jungle, um, and you you start getting the feeling that uh, that something is 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 awry, and then things start happening in other places around the world. Where, where did the idea for 
for this kind of grand scale of this thing come from? I think it's probably a case of form following function. Um, I wasn't, I didn't really want to write the book about one sort of big spider. Um, that seemed, I don't know, that seemed weird to me. Um, and so I wanted sort of these, these swarms of spiders. And the problem was if I just put it in one place, the book would be four pages long because people would get eaten and it would be over. Uh, so I needed to give them some space. But I also, for this book, I thought it would be really fun to kind of do, you know, I really liked the idea of sort of these, these bands of travelers. Um, you can jump from one to the other. It allows you to sort of um, feel fresh. Um, and, you know, I, I, thinking about movies that were models, like the movie Independence Day that came out in the 90s was sort of a, a structural model where you have, you know, a bunch of different heroes all over the place trying to solve sort of this plague. Um, and I think that was sort of what I was thinking about. Um, but, yeah, I think more than anything, it just came from the, the, the base concept that if we have these swarms of spiders that eat everything in front of them, you, you need to move the action. Otherwise, you're going to run out of heroes really quickly. <laughs> right. um, in writing this book, um, what were some of the challenges that you came up against uh, in writing this style of book uh, that you had not written before? Uh, the biggest thing was sort of, again, so actually that structure, the globe being structure. I love it. And as much as I love it, I'm mean, going to, I love all the characters. You know, every reader has a different favorite character. So every reader is annoyed that their favorite character doesn't get more time on the page. Um, so that was, you know, that was a struggle to try and sort of balance out who the main characters were um, and give them enough space. Um, I think the, as, as crazy as it sounds, I think the biggest challenge was, um, as I was writing this, I couldn't believe that it was supposed to be this fun to write. Um, and so I kept on stopping and thinking, like, what am I doing wrong? Why is this fun? Um, which I know sounds it's kind of like complaining that, you know, I started complaining, you know, uh, you know, well, you know, what was the biggest challenge of your day? And I was like, I got some candy. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of what it felt like. I just I, I just kept on sort of pinching myself. And one of the things I've loved of writing as Ezekiel Boone, and this comes as this greatest shock to me, is it's really fun. Um, you know, the books, I think the books are really, really fun to read. Um, and oh, I think that, that thank you. But I think that part of that comes from they are fun to write. Writing as Ezekiel Boone is a hoot. I mean, I'm I'm actually revising, uh, finishing revisions right now for my fourth Ezekiel Boone book, um, which comes out in October. And it's uh, I, as I'm reading it, I'm like, this is fun. This is good. What did I, how did I do this? Um, and it just kind of came as a surprise to me that that writing, because you know, writing is a job, but that I like I like my job. Yeah, and you should. You know, we we've been programmed to think that anything uh important and and worthwhile should, you know, have some some gravitas and and should should feel important. And if you're having fun, it's probably not going to be any good at the end. Uh but I I'm like you, when when you read it and it's fun, you know that you had fun writing it and it's it's infectious and it it comes through and it a little bit like we talked about you know that that contract you have with the reader that if you if, if a character behaves a certain way they need to stay true to themselves to the character that you created um you know that that same thing works with the the writer you, you can feel that that the the writer was sincere um in their fun yeah and i think you know what I, speaking about about that sincerity I think that's actually one of the things that's really important um, when you talk about sort of literary writers who are writing genre or genre writers who are writing literary is that you have to sincerely love the books. Like I, I, I you know, I, there are some writers who I think who think, oh, it would be really easy to write a genre novel. I'm just going to crank one out. And they don't get that. Like, it's not easy. You have to actually love these books and respect them. Like you have to really love what you're doing and be sincere to the reader. Like, you're you're asking people to give you a couple of hours of their time, and it's you can't waste it. Yeah. Um. So speaking of that, what can a writer do um, if they want to be a better genre writer? It, you know, of course you have to read a lot. Um. But as you're reading, are there are there things that you should look for? Are there? Uh, is it just immersing yourself in the kind of material so that you? know the language to speak um like what what can a writer do to kind of bone up uh to be a better writer for those genres so i think the best thing you can do i mean obviously the best thing you can do is to read but the second best thing you can do is to reread and reread really carefully and what i mean by that is that pick a couple of the books that you love and you think are great that you've already read 
and read them again, trying to figure out how and why it works. So if you, you know, at the end of a certain novel, if you were sort of choked up, uh, find yourself on the edge of tears, ask yourself, well, why do you feel this way? Where is it that the author made you care about? Okay, no, is it before that? Or was it before that? Go back to the first page and ask yourself, how do they set it up on the first page so the last page works for me? You know, what is the, you know, what is that image that happens immediately? And actually, a great little example of something really, really small, tiny example is the movie Die Hard. Um, you know, the opening scene of it is actually Bruce Willis clutching, he's clutching the armrest in front of him because um, he's scared of flying. And he's clutching it, and you get a shot of his hand, and right there the question is raised about his marriage because it shows his, his, you know, his left hand. And right there we start with this idea of, of okay, is this an important question? And it's a small, tiny thing that you can gets built up over and over and over again. But as you reread these books that work, you can see these little things that sort of come together and aggregate. So I guess I would say as a writer, what you're trying to do is to figure out how to read, not as a reader, but as a writer, to understand how these pieces go together. Right. Um, we talked early on in our conversation about uh, realizing that E.B. White uh, um, uh, revised. And uh, as a writer, and, and, and what you were just saying there really uh, – kind of brought this to me um that not only reread but as a writer doing the rewrites um as you're going through your revisions do you look for those things um that you just talked about th that you pick up on when you're reading do you look for those opportunities to really leave clues for the reader or make sure that you're setting things up make sure the gun is put on the mantle at the proper time and then making sure that you follow through with that for the reader uh, so that we we maintain that trust. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the gun on the mantle is a great example because I tell students all the time, I say, you know, that it's that saying, you know, if the gun's on the mantle in the first act, it has to go off in the third act. Well, the inverse of that is true, which is if you're going to have a gun go off in the third act, it has to be on the mantle in the first act. Um, and you know, I can't tell you how many times I've read a story or a novel where something happens and, you know, we're 150 pages in. And somebody gets shot, and for the first time we discover that you know somebody with them happens to be a doctor, and it's like oh, you know we could have mentioned that beforehand. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, and I think what's important to remember is that we don't write like that, but we rewrite like that. So you should go back and look and say, you know, look, are there places where I, I flub? You know, if I'm going to have, you know, my character is going to need to, my character is going to need to be able to shoot a gun, you know, on page two sixty two. So when do they get the gun and how do they know how to shoot it? Um, and so you need to set all this stuff up. And, but I think more importantly, it actually tends to be about emotion. Um, you know, how can we set up how our character cares and who they are as a person? You know, is there something you can do early on that shows your character as a decent human being or caring about their wife or caring about their dog or, you know, the kind of person who will run away when faced with difficulty? And and the Eagles can only rescue uh, one character from Mordor, and uh, <laughs> Tol Tolkien did that already. So yeah, they, right, yeah, exactly. Um, it, Zeke, the uh, the new book is called Zero Day, um, and before that, Skitter and the Hatching. Uh, I want everyone to pick up a copy of the full trilogy. They're going to love it. Um, it carries my absolute seal of approval. Um, it's been so much fun talking to you. Uh, if people are not familiar with your work, where can they find you to get into all that you do? And you said you have a fourth book uh, coming out later in the year. Um, where can people you know, keep up to date with all that good stuff? Thanks. Uh, easiest place, of course, would be EzekielBoone.com. Uh, my publisher in the U.S. is Simon Schuster, and there's a, uh, I'm sure I have some sort of a author page on there but ezekielboon.com and uh you know the hatching and skitter and zero day are available at pretty much any bookstore you want or by ebook so i'd love to pick them up um i would say to follow me on twitter but honestly i've been so bad about posting on twitter recently that you can follow me but it might be really anticlimactic um so yeah but thank you very much for having me hank this has uh, been awesome uh, absolutely um is the the fourth book that's coming out is oh. called the mansion can, can you give us a little hint as to what it might be about Sure. Um, it is kind of a haunted house story. Nice. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's a big doorstop kind of book, um, and it's it's I think it's fun as heck. And uh, no spiders. It's uh, the the trilogy finishes with zero day, goes the hatching, skitter, and zero day, and then on to new stuff. 
Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Zeke, it's been so much fun talking. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Brian moved in closer, entering the rusty greenhouse through its eastern arch, keeping clear of the subject's line of sight. He pressed through the rose house, nothing but thorns, and into the grapery, nothing but vines. The meditation tones of the wind chimes were like fingers lipping crystal goblets. Two marble children hugged each other, swallowed by the swamp of a neglected fountain. Brian's shadow entered the palm house, the domed space at center, and the rest of him followed. Brian took aim at the figure's back and whistled. Hands up there! The figure waggled its shoulders a little, reaching for a weapon, maybe. Did you hear me? Hands up! Now! Brian circled the intruder. He took out his penlight and shone it in the man's face. Shit. Burlap and buttons. Just one of the stupid scarecrows. He thumbed his calm. False alarm! But Abby didn't reply. He'd lost signal. He slung his rifle back and put up his fists. He delivered a slow-motion punch to the scarecrow's head, an old potato sack with black lettering down one cheek. Its red button eyes were sewn on with plastic thread, maybe dental floss. The mouth was a bright red shoestring hot glued to the burlap. One end had shaken loose so that the mouth drooped like a stroke victim's. Brian delivered a slow karate kick to its body, a business suit stuffed with hay. A stink rose. The guts were rotted. Only this one scarecrow had survived the storm. A couple dozen others had fallen face down in the mud of the palm house, strewn about like martyrs of some great scarecrow war. Motion caught his eye, and he frowned. A second scarecrow had survived the storm. He hadn't noticed it before, but he should have. This one wore a yellow hard hat and carried an axe. The hard hat was caked with mud, as if the scarecrow had been on the ground. Had someone righted it? Brian turned away from it, disturbed, and noticed a third scarecrow leaning against a nearby wall. This one wore a clown costume and mud-soaked rainbow hair. How the hell had he missed that one? He was an idiot. If that had been a person, they might have shot him in the head by now. He backed away from the trio of scarecrows. They reminded him of some Sunday school tableau. He was about to make his exit when a white face flew from the shadows. The hockey mask of Jason Voorhees, the machete-wielding psychopath of the Friday the 13th movies. The mask landed at Brian's feet and stared up at him. It was a dime-store plastic thing, trailing a broken length of pink rubber band, with two sad hollows for eyes above an extruded nub of nose. The cheeks were pierced with little holes and bore three bloody streaks of war paint. Some poor scarecrow had lost its fright mask. Brian bent and picked it up, turned it in his hand, letting moonlight play across the concave interior face, creating that optical illusion where the gaze follows you. He lifted the mask, thinking of some childhood Halloween. When? Decades ago, when he'd been Jason Voorhees, stalking Sleepy Hollow, his tinfoil machete dripping Heinz 57. When did I get to be so old? People didn't appreciate the classic scares anymore, the old shock cuts and startle tricks. He made little panting horror flick sounds, ch 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 ah ah held the mask to his own face and looked through its cut-out eyes. Trick or treat, he whispered. The answer was trick. A dozen scarecrows surrounded him. A dozen more writhed up from the mud. The eyeless corpse of Ferris the gate guard shrugged a hungry pecking crow and pounced. <laughs>